is October 10, 2023. And we have a very special guest on the show today, Dr. Gerald Horn. Gerald Horn holds the Morris Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Gerald Horn is an activist, scholar, researcher, archivist, author, historian, and much, much more. He has written at least 47 books and is considered one of the most prolific history authors of all time. His most recent books are Acknowledging Radical Histories, which is a collection of interviews of Dr. Horn by Chris Steele, spanning several years. That book is already available and can be ordered uh, right away. And I dare say a Gerald Horn reader, which is a sort of greatest hits of Dr. Uh, Horn's writings. I dare say is edited by Tian uh, Aliyah Paris, and that will be available uh, by the end of the month, but you can pre-order it uh, right now. Um, Dr. Horn, thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome back to the show. Thank you for inviting me. So today I wanted to go uh, around the horn and talk to you about some of uh, the domestic and international events that are happening right now. Uh, first, um, on Saturday, October 7, 2023, the Palestinian resistance in Gaza launched a historic surprise attack against Israel. The surprise attack referred to as Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. It's the biggest attack launched by a Palestinian resistance force in years and broke through, and broke through a nearly two decade blockade of Gaza. Of course, Israel has used this attack to expand their genocidal campaign against the Palestinians. The latest reports I have, um, and I'm sure there are actually are new reports, is that Israel has cut off the, the Gazans from all food, water, fuel, and supplies and more. Israel has, has also augmented their bombing campaign. The Israeli Air Force continued to target Palestinian homes and other civilian infrastructure in Gaza on the fifth consecutive day. Um, over 700 Gazans, including 143 children, have been killed, and over 4,000 people have been wounded in Palestine. Um, and according to local media reports, Israeli warplanes targeted more than 200 locations inside Gaza on Monday alone. The targets included mosques, uh, civilian buildings, including schools, hospitals, homes, and other essential facilities, exacerbating the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Um, Israel is also using the banned chemical weapon, white phosphorus uh, bombs um, on civilians in densely populated areas in Northern Gaza. Um, and several international bodies and, and international rights organizations have claimed that, that Israeli's actions over the past few days constitute war crimes. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. Um, stated that it's supplying arms and ammunition to Israel a day after deploying its warship into the Mediterranean. But let me stop here um, and ask you what your reaction is to the Palestinian resistance attack on Israel and what is the historical significance? Well, first, like a cinematographer, let's pan out first and then zero in for the establishing shot. Uh, panning out, I have been struck by the fact that in the last 24 hours, the U.S. administration was able to knock together a letter uh, signed by the leaders of Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, establishing solidarity with the Israelis basically suggesting in so many words that the Israelis be given a free hand, uh, which is code for fomenting war crimes. Now, I find this striking because it did not include Japan and South Korea, uh, which, as you know, the North Atlantic Treaty Organizations, Organization, NATO, which includes those aforementioned powers, has been trying to include Japan and South Korea in a kind of Asian NATO uh, focused on China. Now, what's remarkable about that is either A, they didn't ask Seoul and Tokyo to be included, which means, or suggests, I should say, that perhaps they were afraid of the answer that they would receive, or B, they asked and were rebuffed. And if they were rebuffed, it might be because if you look around the world, particularly in the all-important Arab and Islamic world, uh, there is a formidable thumbs down on what Israel is doing. Even Saudi Arabia, which we were told in the prelude to October 7th, 
was on the verge of signing a historic accord with the Israeli authorities. And in fact, in the last few weeks, you've seen Israeli cabinet members uh, travel to Saudi Arabia. The Saudi statement was uh, unequivocal in its support for the Palestinians, which then brought on condemnation from Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. You know, I'm sure, that the Turks have been at odds with the Israeli authorities. Recall that there was an international meeting uh, a decade or so ago where Mr. Erdogan, the preeminent Turkish leader, it seemed like he was about to get it into blows with an Israeli leader with whom he shared a stage. The Turks, uh, of course, are quite close to Hamas, which has been given credit uh, for this uh, path-breaking attack on the Israeli authorities. And there have been demonstrations in Istanbul. And Lynn, look at the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, particularly the most populous, predominantly Islamic nations, speaking of Indonesia. Uh, they've thrown cold water on this Israeli enterprise, as has Malaysia, another predominantly Islamic nation, and also a rising economy, not to mention Pakistan. And so if Seoul and Tokyo did not sign on to this Biden North Atlantic letter, there might be good reason because they do not necessarily want to alienate these major uh, trading partners. At the same time, pay careful and close attention to what's going on in the United States itself. Uh, number one, in the New York Times just a day or so ago, you had a columnist who uttered words I thought were only allowed in left-wing media. Uh, that is to say that the planet on which we reside is on the verge of a new world order, uh, which involves the declension of U.S. imperialism, that is a very bitter pill to swallow. But in light of the fact that as we speak on October 10th, 2023 in the afternoon, despite protestations to the contrary by the Israeli authorities, it is not clear if Israel has control over their southern border 30 miles in, 30 miles from Gaza. Uh, imagine what would happen if the United States authorities did not have control over their southern border uh, with Mexico, uh, for example. Uh, that would be uh, quite portentous, uh, quite alarming in Washington. And this signals a real turning point with regard to the correlation of forces, not only in historic Palestine, but possibly uh, globally. In that context, note that uh, Kevin McCarthy, the once impossible future speaker of the House of Representatives, second in line to the presidency up to a few days ago, has spoken of what he calls a new axis of evil, uh, speaking of Russia, China, and Iran. Uh, with regard to Iran, you know that the U.S. authorities have sent a naval flotilla uh, off the coast of Israel. There has been a drumbeat of propaganda and misinformation and disinformation including the Wall Street Journal just the other day, saying that the hand of Iran is behind this Hamas attack. Uh, it makes me remember that the late Pentagon chief, Donald Rumsfeld, oftentimes suggested that if you have a problem, the way to deal with it is to enlarge the problem, which sounds illogical, uh, but it's reflective and redolent redolent of the uh, swash, swashbuckling incompetence of U.S. imperialism. Uh, that is to say, uh, they are obviously uh, dusting off war plans involving an attack on Iran, uh, which conceivably could draw in the other purported members of the axis of evil, uh, speaking of Russia and China, uh, which would allow U.S. imperialism uh, to accomplish in one fell swoop a triple knockout blow, uh, knocking out Iran and their dem demented imagination, uh, knocking out Russia, which they are now involved in a losing conflict with in Ukraine, and then knocking out the big enchilada, the People's Republic of China. Uh, we should take this very seriously. Uh, it may portend, I'm afraid to say, uh, 
uh, the onset of uh, World War III. Now, given that, we should not be surprised that the U.S. left and U.S. dissidents in general should be uh, on guard at this fraught moment because the onslaught of propaganda has tackled us as well. I'm thinking of the rather alarmist and hysterical remarks of the emeritus Harvard Law School professor, Alan Dershowitz, who has suggested that campus radicals need to be cracked down on because the demonstrations, for example, in Times Square just the other day ago, uh, he's laying at the doorstep of these uh, so-called campus radicals. Uh, you see that Lawrence Summers, a former president of Harvard, former cabinet member under Clinton and a leading official under Obama, has excoriated the school where he works, Harvard University, speaking of the administration, which has just uh, installed a black woman president, speaking of Claudia Gay, uh, for their supposed silence with regard to not supporting Iran. Uh, that is to say that the conflict in Ukraine obviously has involved deep fissures within the body politic, not least on Capitol Hill, uh, not least with regard to the two-party duopoly, the Democrats and Republicans. This conflict in Israel-Palestine is a horse of a different color. And when the U.S. ruling class is united, it oftentimes uh, spells ill for the rest of us. The, the late the writer and poet Amiri Baraka, with regard to the Black community, uh, used to call for unity without uniformity. Nowadays, the call from the ruling class with regard to Israel is unity and uniformity. And those who dare to speak out uh, like a nail uh, sticking up from a piece of lumber can be expected to be uh, hammered down. And at the same time, we see that Israel is in a real crisis, not only because of the fact that as we speak, it's unclear if they control their southern border, but on their northern border, uh, there have been, we have been told at least, attacks from Hezbollah, the force in Lebanon, southern Lebanon in particular, uh, which fought the Israeli authorities to a standstill in 2006, which has an enormous uh, cache of rockets and other weaponry. Uh, that is to say that Israel might be on the verge of a two-front war. And note as well that Hezbollah is also, like Hamas, uh, being seen as a, a kind of proxy, if you like, <laughs> for the Iranians, which gives further credence to this idea that the U.S. authorities and their Israeli sidekicks would like to expand this conflict and I think that they would like to do so because Israel is facing a rather unsustainable moment, not only because of the possibility of a two-front war, but also pre-October 7th, you had this enormous rift in the Israeli body politic because of the attempt by the Netanyahu regime to clip the wings of the powerful Israeli Supreme Court so that uh, he could possibly uh, avoid uh, prison. And in that regard, he had brokered these agreements with right-wing parties, right-wing parties which are heavily dependent upon the ultra-Orthodox uh, in uh, Israel for political support. Interestingly enough, uh, since this crisis has erupted, uh, we haven't heard that much from the ultra-Orthodox. Instead, we've heard that there is an attempt now to forge a government of national unity uh, in Israel, which would force some of Mr. Netanyahu's right-wing partners to give up their cabinet seats. Now, if that happens, that, that will be of, significant, of significance. And I should also say, in terms of unsustainability, part of the problem in Israel right now economically is that in this country of 9 million, you've had a call up of the reserves. Uh, which means that people who ordinarily might be uh, stocking grocery stores or sitting in office cubicles are now on the battle lines. Uh, that will lead to a seizing up of the economy. Uh, this is taking place at the time uh, 
when the ultra orthodox who of course support oftentimes disproportionately the right wing parties they have a nice little hustle going on because the young men uh, they are not necessarily obligated to uh, pick up a rifle and go uh, into the military uh, their job is to study holy books and to procreate uh, which obviously if you have any sort of pacifist intention or just don't want to dodge bullets, it gives you an incentive to join the ultra orthodox uh, because, because of course uh, their inactivity is subsidized by the state, a, a good deal of the state budget in fact. And so at the same time, when you may have a seizing up of the economy because of this conflict, you still have these welfare payments and subsidy, subsidy payments going into the pockets of the ultra-Orthodox, which obviously is going to call upon the U.S. Treasury to give out more handouts beyond the military materiel that has already been sent and that uh, Mr. Biden announced even more uh, in his speech just this afternoon, where, by the way, he suggested that 14 uh, U.S. nationals had been slain and, of course, an untold number have been taken under detention, or as they say in the United States, uh, taken hostage or kidnapped, to use those inflamed words, which, of course, are rarely applied to the Palestinians who are kidnapped and taken as hostage uh, by the Israeli authorities. So at the same time, uh, another problem that the Israelis will face, in addition to the Hezbollah on the north and the obviously well-prepared Hamas and their allies on the South, is that like the Vietnamese during the U.S. war, culminating in a defeat of U.S. imperialism in 1975, the opposition forces in Gaza have constructed a series of complicated tunnels. Uh, recall that if you look at the documentaries about Vietnam, you'll see that one of the reasons why the bombing campaigns involving a unleashing and unloading of tons of explosives on Vietnam did not have as much impact as U.S. imperialism predicted because oftentimes the comrades were underground. And I dare say that with these U.S. jets now bombing uh, Gaza to smithereens in terms of these pictures you see of destroyed uh, buildings, let's see what happens with regard to these tunnels. Uh, we should also mention in that context that uh, as we speak, you see that the ports of Israel have been under assault by opposition forces. Uh, these ports, of course, oftentimes welcome oil tankers. Uh, in terms of the aforementioned economic and financial problems that Israel is now facing, the fact that some of their major ports uh, might now be under siege is something that they're going to have to think long and hard about. And thinking long and hard also involves thinking long and hard about this so-called intelligence failure, whereby even U.S. imperialism had little inkling of what was about to unfold on October 7th. Now, I don't give much credibility to some of the allegations by our left-wing friends that uh, Israel basically allowed this to happen, U.S. imperialism allowed this to happen so that they could escalate. Uh, I think that that does not give sufficient credit uh, to the Hamas and opposition forces. It's almost as if uh, our friends on the left find it unbelievable <laughs> that the Israelis uh, might find themselves in a crisis, that they are involved in a war where, according to some observers, uh, as we speak, they've already lost. And that is said because we know that in previous conflicts, Israel has traded uh, one, uh, has traded for one Israeli soldier and returned hundreds of uh, Palestinians. Or they even traded for the remains of Israeli soldiers, uh, given these hostages, quote unquote, that the Palestinians have taken. Uh, this will be a restraining factor in terms of the flexibility of the Israeli authorities. We know that the Egyptians and the Qataris are trying to act as middlemen uh, with regard to uh, exchanging of prisoners. Uh, 
But the Egyptian authorities, and I dare say the Qatari authorities, have to be very careful uh, because to, to resurrect a term from, uh, from the olden times, the, quote, Arab street, unquote, is obviously in solidarity uh, with their Palestinian brothers and sisters. And with Egypt, for example, going into elections, uh, General al-Sisi has to be very careful. I noticed that the Rafah crossing from Gaza into Egypt has been bombed repeatedly uh, because uh, we suspected that with the siege and the curtailing of electricity, food, and the like, that the Rafah crossing would be essential in terms of circumventing that. Uh, we know that just a few days ago, just after October 7th, uh, we saw a, a police officer in Alexandria uh, kill uh, two Israeli tourists. Uh, that kind of episode uh, perhaps could be uh, expected to occur more frequently the longer this war goes on. And the longer this war goes on, the more apparent and evident it will be that the Israelis and their sidekicks in Washington have suffered an ignominious defeat uh, because Israel wants a quick end to this conflict because of the aforementioned knock-on effects negatively on the economy. The opposition recognizes that as long as this conflict is extended, uh, in a sense, they are prevailing uh, because it forces the international community, particularly the Turks, the Indonesians, the Malaysians, the Pakistanis, and ultimately, I would say, those who want to remain on their good side, which would include China in the first instance, uh, to put pressure on Israel and US imperialism to make concessions. Although concessions, <laughs> that word is not in Mr. Netanyahu's vocabulary. And so it will be a very bitter pill for him to swallow uh, if he is forced to make concessions. It could lead to the downfall of his government and from his point of view, or worse than that, the hastening of his winding up behind bars. And in that regard, uh, look at the New York Times Magazine article that appeared uh, Sunday before last, a real takedown of Mr. Netanyahu, uh, one of the most uh, comprehensive critiques uh, of his uh, ill-considered ways ever appearing in the US media, I'm sure that the New York Times may be ruining the fact that they published that just before October 7th. We should also take a moment to look at the unorthodox tactics of the opposition, uh, not only using uh, boats that you might uh, well espy on Lake Michigan uh, in the waters off Chicago, that is to say very small boats with outboard motors, but also paragliders, uh, the fact that they developed these flying contraptions of featuring one individual, which of course bespeaks the failure of the Iron Dome and all the sophisticated technology, so-called, uh, that uh, led many to conclude that Israel had one of the top five militaries in the world, something that's obviously going to have to be reconsidered. And also their use of drones and the dropping of grenades uh, from drones the fact that they were able to supposedly to take tanks away uh, from the Israeli military, invaded the uh, Israeli military bases. And then there are the global consequences besides what already has been referenced concerning the international community, uh, politically and diplomatically, but also the price of oil. Uh, apparently uh, today and yesterday, uh, there was a spike in the price of oil, uh, which then foils the already collapsing attempt of U.S. imperialism and its allies to put a cap on the price of a barrel of oil aimed at Russia so that Russia could not have the wherewithal to fight in Ukraine. Uh, that uh, particular initiative was already collapsing, but it's going to collapse further uh, given uh, this conflict in Israel-Palestine. And I would be remiss if I fail to mention uh, two final points. Uh, one, not only what's already been suggested, that is to say the impact on the conflict in Ukraine and the conflict in Taiwan, but secondly, I think it's appropriate when we've just marked Indigenous Peoples Day in the United States of America, 
to acknowledge that uh, Indigenous Peoples Day in the United States of America should remind us of the commonality between Israel and the United States, two settler societies, uh, both of whom have sought to expel the indigenous population, the United States case, uh, liquidate the indigenous population. Indeed, uh, I would argue that what you're seeing right now in Gaza was a hundred times worse in, for example, Texas in the 19th century. In fact, uh, I have said previously that with regard to this justified slogan that has been adopted by the Black Liberation Movement uh, in this country, that is to say, say her name, uh, Sandra Bland, uh, say her name, uh, Brianna, for example, of Louisville, we have entire peoples that have been liquidated as a result of settler colonialism in the United States. In my book on Texas, I have a half a page and a footnote uh, detailing the countless indigenous groupings that have virtually disappeared, gone with the wind as a result of settler colonialism. It, it reminds me of the drone policy of President Obama, who decided that the better part of wisdom was to kill militants on the battlefield more so than capture them, allowing campaigns to arise to free them uh, once they are disappeared out of sight, out of mind. And he, perhaps unbeknownst to himself, perhaps wittingly, was basically following the footsteps of 19th century presidents and leaders in Texas who pursued a similar policy uh, to the point where, uh, as I'm afraid to say, uh, the U.S. comrades in Berlin suggested in the 1930s that they had a thing or two to learn from Washington in terms of liquidating entire populations and clearing the land for German settlers uh, as they did in what is now Namibia at the beginning of the 20th century against the Nama and Herero people, the first genocide of the 20th century, which was a kind of training ground for German colonialism and imperialism as they executed their wicked ways in Central and Eastern Europe in the 1930s and 1940s. And so fortunately, what has changed with regard to 2023 is an alert international community that intends to stay the hand of the Israeli expansionists and genocidaires, an alert US progressive and radical movement that intends to do likewise. And that, it seems to me, is in the self-interest of all of us. Thank you for that. And I think you, you, you pretty much hit up on all the points that I wanted to get into. I guess one follow-up that you touched on is um, now that the entire Western media has shifted their focus from Ukraine to Palestine, um, what does this mean for the U.S. proxy war um, against Russia? Do you think that the U.S. will be able to juggle both? Uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, I think... What that means is that the United States is going to try to expand the battlefield. <laughs> that is to say, uh, already in the often obscure corners of the U.S. media, uh, you see stories about Armenia versus Ar Azerbaijan. Uh, you see stories about how Russia supposedly has sold out Armenia as the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh an enclave within the territory of Azerbaijan were forced to flee, but that, obviously that has more to do with the fact that the Armenian authorities, uh, rather unwisely, thought that they could uh, play a double game with Moscow and cut a deal <laughs> with the U.S. authorities, a leading number of whom had visited Yerevan in the past few weeks, and then uh, they've expressed shock and surprise when uh, that double game fails. But also keep a, a close eye on what's going on in Georgia, not the U.S. southern state, but the former Soviet Republic, where a number of uh, U.S. allied uh, officials have been detained on grounds that they were thinking of executing a so-called color revolution uh, in Georgia because the Georgian regime in Tbilisi is perceived as much too close and much too friendly uh, to Moscow. Uh, 
expect uh, something similar perhaps to unfold in Bratislava, uh, in Slovakia, where an election is just brought to power, uh, a regime led by Robert Fiso, oftentimes pronounced Fico, uh, who is lukewarm at best towards the Ukrainian escapade. Uh, we should expect that new regime to be challenged uh, by the Myrmidons of color revolution, uh, which then U.S. hopes will then drag in Moscow <laughs> to that particular battlefield. In other words, as noted, per Rumsfeld, the issue is, from the point of view of U.S. imperialism, if you have a problem, the way to deal with that problem is to enlarge it, to enlarge it from Ukraine to Slovakia to Armenia to Georgia to Israel-Palestine to Syria to Iran and so on. Uh, that obviously is going to increase the workload of progressive forces in the, in the, in the United States in particular. Uh, but I think we should also remind the hotheads in Washington that uh, one of the reasons their ideological ancestors in the so-called Confederate States of America, uh, one of the reasons uh, why they were compelled to relinquish their most valuable investment in the bodies of enslaved Africans is because they overreached. They could have cut a deal <laughs> with the Lincoln regime, which was willing to negotiate with them. They decided that the better part of wisdom was to overthrow the Lincoln regime. And they wound up losing everything. Uh, and of course, they're still trying to make a comeback in that regard, but they haven't learned that lesson, uh, that uh, it's not wise to overreach. And I think part of the problem is that particularly, as, as I've said repeatedly, that uh, in the past 75 years, the NAACP and that wing of the black movement cut a deal with U.S. imperialism. That is to say, in return for anti-Jim Crow concessions, they would throw overboard those like Paul Robeson, who had a critique of U.S. imperialism. And so therefore, this major component of the Democratic Party constituency, speaking of the NAACP, the Congressional Black Caucus, is oftentimes missing in action when it comes to foreign policy which then helps to empower further the right wing within the Democratic Party, which then allows the right wing of the Democratic Party, per Mr. Biden, to get bogged down in quicksand and morasses and quagmires all around planet Earth, which is precisely what you see unfolding in historic Palestine as we speak. And I guess my last question for the day is, you know, um, the timing of, of this historic Palestinian attack against Israel, to what extent do you think that has to do with the changing global correlation of forces where we see the rise of China, rise of a multipolar world, a situation where China has even influenced um, sort of peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia? To, is, is there any connection between the timing of this attack and the changing global correlation of forces? Well, let me answer subjectively and objectively. Subjectively, uh, I'm not certain. That is to say, I'm not certain if the forces in Palestine decided to attack at this precise moment because of the change in global correlation of forces. Obviously, with regard to the complexity of this offensive, it took quite a bit of time to draw up a battle plan. And uh, even if they drew it up months ago, it's unclear whether or not they had the global context in mind, but objectively, it's evident that the success thus far uh, of this offensive and the fact, I have to repeat it because uh, I, I confess I would not have envisioned this as recently as October 6, 2023, that southern Israel, 30 miles from the Gaza border, might still be subject to contestation not necessarily under the firm control of the Israeli authorities. Uh, that is to say that the Palestinians uh, since 1947-48 have been clamoring for a right of return and have oftentimes tried to deploy nonviolent tactics leading to their blood being spilled profusely in the streets. And now, <laughs> as we speak, uh, by force of arms, they at least are on the cusp of a kind of compelled 
right of return. And in terms of the end game, uh, I should take a moment to allude to this. Uh, I respect those, particularly in the international community, who say that we need to be pushing for a two-state solution. Uh, I respect that point of view. But speaking objectively, uh, the way things are going now, the end game might wind up being some sort of binational state. That is to say, the Jewish supremacist state articulated by Israel uh, might wind up becoming a fossil of history and that the only way forward is for equal rights from the river to the sea, uh, so to speak. Uh, just like in South Africa, the pre cursor of the apartheid state that we now see unfolding as we speak from the river to the sea, uh, we did not say that uh, there should be a, a two-state solution. That is to say for the Africans and the Europeans, we decided that the better part of wisdom was to have equal rights for all. And in articulating this, your audience should keep in mind that I am seeking to describe objective forces that are unfolding. It's up to the people of themselves to determine uh, what the ultimate fate from the river to the sea shall be. However, as a historian, uh, I feel duty bound and obligated to suggest that as we speak, there are objective forces that are pointing a certain direction, irrespective of what the subjective inclinations and intentions might be, including those who I say, I think are operating with positive intentions uh, who call for a two-state solution. Thank you for all of your answers. I could ask you questions for days, as you know, but um, I'll end it here.